Hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, my name is Melissa Ada, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how to prioritize your web performance optimizations. So um, one thing that I always hear is, you know, I really want to work on web performance, but I have this whole product to build or product to maintain. So how do I do that um, on this side? So I'll be talking to you about that today. First, a little bit about me. Um, this is actually my first talk in Europe and as a resident of Europe. So I recently moved. <laughs> <laughs> so I recently moved from New York to Ireland. Um, in New York, I was on Etsy's web performance team, and my main focus was partnering with product teams to help them improve their web performance. Um, what else? I also organized the New York Web Performance Meetup along with Sergey Chernyshev. So shout out to Sergey. Shout out to Sergey Tongue Twister um, because he helped me um, kind of. Uh, give in inspiration for today's talk. And then I also recently wrote, um, along with Rick Scomi, the web performance chapter of the Web Almanac 2022, and I'll be sharing my findings from that today throughout the talk. So what is Web Almanac? First, let's take a step back and look at HTTP Archive. So HTTP Archive tracks how the web is built by periodically running synthetic tests on millions of user URLs. And then Web Almanac is the annual publication that analyzes that HTTP archive data. You can find more about the methodology and all of the publications at that link below. So this is the chapter that I co-wrote along with Rick. You might also see some other familiar names here, so shout out to Barry. Um, and yeah, I'll t today I'll be sharing my findings. So let's get into it. Who's ever run a, a lighthouse test or a web page test or somehow ended up on a huge list of web performance optimizations? Yeah? <laughs> Same. And isn't it kind of overwhelming because you're like, okay, I, I know that web performance is important, but how do I do this? Or what do I even focus on? What is going to give me the biggest benefit, right? So let's talk about it. The first, or zeroth step, I guess, is to measure. So we need to know what our measurements, what our metrics are, and what our weak points are before we can assess what the return on investment is, right? For example, um, we can see that since the HTTP archive has measured the amount of good core web vitals by device over time, we can now see that through historical data, um, the good core web vitals, the percentage of sites that have good core web vitals is increasing over time since it's been added to search rankings. So shout out to y'all who are on the web making that happen. But one number isn't the whole story. So when you do have metrics, you want to make sure that you don't just focus on one number and say, OK, that's good or that's bad. It's a little bit fuzzier than that, as y'all may know. <laughs> so let's. As, a, as an example, let's look at the percentage of sites that have good FID or first input delay by device, right? So it's looking pretty good across the web ever since this metric was released. Um, and so you might have good FID and you might say, oh, okay, I don't need to worry about responsiveness, right? However, that might not be the full story. So FID only measures the first input and then it only measures from when the user input something to when the event handler starts responding. <clears throat> Sorry, I forget to breathe when I'm up here. It's hard. <laughs> um, but it only measures from when the user first um, um, gives an input and then to when the event handler starts responding. So it doesn't measure what the event handler is doing at all. So that might be an important piece of the puzzle. Let's say if the event handler is processing, opening up a, up a drop down and populating that data. In contrast, let's look at IMP. So IMP performance by device, it's still, um, on desktop, it's fairly good. But on mobile, we see a pretty big difference. So one thing to note about IMP is it's an aggregate of all or most inputs on the page. And then also, um, it does measure the time between the first input, or not the first, all, all inputs, and um, the next paint. So that way we get the full kind of cycle. But be careful with IMP because even though it does measure until the next paint, 
it might not be the paint that was triggered by, or that you're expecting to be triggered by the um, input. So now we can see the kind of, you know, we do need to measure our stuff, but don't just take one number at face value and think, okay, that is good or that is bad. Um, so now that we have our data, let's verify um, what, what's actually going on on our site. So <laughs> honorable mention, um, you want to verify the problem is a problem. And an honorable mention to a problem that I uh, solved early on in my web performance career, which was actually explicitly hard coded as synthetic only behavior. So I was running a web page test and seeing um, something come up that was not right. So um, it was programmed to load all images synchronously immediately. Um, but if it was not a synthetic test and it was a real user, then they would only load the images if the module was open um, by the user. So I just thought, you know, lesson learned the hard way, figured I'd share. Um, make sure that your problem is actually a problem in RUM. So you want to cross-reference RUM at around P75 is the recommended value. And then you also want to look at historic data to kind of make sure that um, this is actually a consistent problem and not just like a one-off blip. So now that we know the problem is actually a problem, let's look at how we assess and prioritize web performance optimizations. So next, we can look at prioritization factors. So a lot of people are familiar with effort and, and impact, right? If you're an engineer or product manager, you kind of know, OK, these are the two main things that we need to evaluate to kind of figure out what's worth our time. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. What I've found is that effort um, comprises of a few things, right? So it's kind of a, um, an average of solution clarity. So let's say that the fix is not super clear, or you're like, I know exactly which line I need to change. It's totally fine. I just need to put up a PR. Next are technical blockers. So let's say that um, you want to use a new image format but the CDN that you're using doesn't support that image format. That's kind of like, okay, well, we could get huge gains from that, but is it it's not possible with our current technical stack, so let's save it for another time. And then next is business blockers. So this could be you know, stakeholder buy-in, or it could be, let's say that your compliance module is built in jQuery. You want to get rid of jQuery, but you have to follow the law. So you kind of have to um, weigh these things. And then next, impact is pretty, is a little bit more straightforward, but the main thing here is level of confidence, right? So how sure are we that this impact, like how sure are we about the level of impact that is happening um, for this task? So let's talk about a few different flavors of all these like prioritization um, variables or parameters, I guess you would say. So the first one is everybody's favorite, low effort, high impact, right? So this is the unicorn. Um, like all things in life, low effort, high impact is going to be few and far between. So cherish them when it happens. Cherish them when you find it. But sadly, I have bad news. It's not going to be every single task. So what I've seen is that solution clarity is usually pretty clear. Technical blockers are usually minimal, and business blockers are minimal, and then the level of confidence is high. So it's kind of like a, a straight shot. We know exactly what we need to do, and there's nothing in our way. So some examples of low effort, high impact tasks or problems could be implementing priority hints. So we found that priority hints um, only 0.3% of the web were, were using priority hints during the time of our research. Um, and the way that you can do this is using the fetch, at, fetch priority attribute. Um, you can set it to high or different values depending on what you actually want. Um, what priority hints does is so the browser has a natural way to prioritize resources. So it could be you know, as the browser learns of them, where they are on the page, a lot of different things. But priority hints allows you to kind of override that and say, no, I want this image to be loaded quickly. So I would recommend checking this out if you um, don't have it on your site. 
Next, um, don't lazy load your LCP resource. So it might be kind of, you know, when you see this, you might think, oh yeah, of course I won't la lazy load my LCP resource. However, um, we found that 9.8% of mobile sites actually do. So it's something where it's kind of like, okay, lazy loading is a be best practice, right? You know, like everybody's like, yes, let's lazy load our images. However, be careful of kind of best practices like this that can kind of bite you performance-wise. <clears throat> so next, let's go to low effort, high confidence. So here, um, the impact can be low to high, it doesn't really matter. Solution clarity, ideally clear, right? Um, technical blockers, we're hoping minimal, and then business blockers, we're hoping minimal as well. So this is kind of the next category of performance optimization that you want to target. So, oh, and one more thing I forgot. Um, with this kind of task, you know, you might be, be tempted to value higher impact over like business blockers or technical blockers or solution clarity, but you want to make something, um, you want to ha have a sustainable practice and you can, um, like this is kind of a good example of something where you can get familiar with web performance knowledge, you can get familiar with the code base, you can also build stakeholder buy-in, which as web performance engineers, I know it can be a little bit hard sometimes, so we want to um, invest in this. So let's look at an example. Um, this is a chart that shows the percentage of good CLS by device. Um, here we can see that in, between 2021 and 2022, um, we had a big jump on mobile, right? So things are looking good in 2022. There are a lot of reasons for this, I'm sure, but one of the big reasons that we suspect is BF Cache. So BF Cache is a technology that allows the browser to cache site um, pages so that when the user goes forward or backward to them, it does not have to reload the page or re-request all of the resources. So here we can see that BF Cache, uh, this is the BF Cache ineligibility from unload handlers. So BF Cache has a lot of eligibility criteria, but we saw that um, this is a pretty common one that was missed. So um, here we can see that 36% 30 per of the top 1,000 sites are ineligible for BF Cache based on the unload handler that they're using. So um, this is how you can fix it. So you want to um, remove any unload event listeners and then add page hide event listeners. And the reason why is because the unload event list, or the unload event um, was built before BF Cache was introduced. And so it doesn't, it, it assumes that the page is no longer needed as soon as the unload event fires. However, page hide was introduced after. And so um, we can, like it will support BF Cache basically. So next, let's look at medium effort, high impact. So this is realistically where most product teams' performance work is gonna live. Um, the solution clarity can be clear to fuzzy, um, technical blockers, there might be some, business blockers, hopefully none, and then high level of confidence is what you wanna target here too. Um, so now that you kind of have, you've gotten some quick wins, you kind of have more of an idea of web performance um, metrics and knowledge, and then also your code base knowledge. Um, you can kind of dig into the fuzzier pieces of web performance on, on your site. So one example of this could be um, render blocking resources, right? So we found that only 20% of mobile sites we're passing the render blocking resources audit in Lighthouse. Um, so render blocking resources are things that completely stop the browser from moving on past that point, right? Um, and so we want to minimize those. So reducing 
uh, render blocking resources, there are a few ways that you can do this. Some of the um, first few that you might, might want to look at are inlining only critical CSS and JavaScript. So we want to reduce the amount of CSS and JavaScript, but we actually do want to keep the critical stuff in there because if we put it into another request, that's taking up more time by increasing um, the amount of requests that the browser has to make. And then removing unused code. So who doesn't love like deleting old code, right? That's like one of the best feelings ever. So get in there, scratch that itch, and remove that, that unused code. And then next, you can use, um, for JavaScript, you can use async or defer to tell the browser that it does not need to be loaded immediately. <clears throat> and then also, you can, for images, once the image comes to the browser, it has to actually decode that image in order to get it on the screen. So you can tell the browser to decode that asynchronously if it's appropriate. So um, here's another example of this kind of task. So we can he see here that this is the chart of LCP image sizes. Um, and we can see here that about one in 20 are um, serving like about a megabyte worth of, like a, a megabyte size of image to a mobile site, right? So that's typically a screen size of about, screen width of about 100, 340 pixels, excuse me. So the way that we can fix this is by using responsive images. So let's talk about some vocabulary first. The intrinsic size of an image is, are the dimensions of, that the image is served to the browser. And then the rendered size is the dimensions that the image is rendered on the page. So the goal of responsive images is to get these numbers as close together as possible so that we're not serving an overly large image to the, um, to the mobile device. I'll spare you the rabbit hole on how to actually implement this. There's a lot of great resources out there online. Next, we can look at high impact, high effort. So these are gonna be the heavy hitters. Um, these tasks typically require cr cross collaboration, especially if your company is structured where ownership is at the feature level. Um, performance exists usually at the page level, right? Like there's a lot of things that you can do in your, your specific feature, but when you wanna look at the data as a whole, you really want to make sure that you're looking at the entire page and how everything plays together. And then this type of work can also be su surface to infrastructure. So who's had like come across web performance optimization and you're like, oh, that would be really great if my company could implement that, but I'm on a product team and I don't have time to overhaul the entire system, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's hard. So this is something where you can surface these tracks of work to infrastructure teams and they can help you out with that. So an example of this would be avoiding domain sharding. So um, in the past, hosting images on a separate domain was beneficial because it would allow the browser to um, download more resources at a given time. But with HTTP2 multiplexing, that is no longer required. And so adding a new domain just kind of, um, just kind of requires more time for the request to be opened up. So we found that 21% of mobile sites are, have cross-hosted LCP images. So if this is you, then definitely look into it. Um, oh, and before that, um, I wanted to say, yeah, so this could be like an infrastructure team, you know, moving the images around or changing a CDN configuration, things like that. And then I could talk about this all day. I could be here for like three hours talking to you about this, but unfortunately, I am bound by the laws of time and space. So here are my closing thoughts. Um, so experience is the best teacher. You wanna take care of those unicorn tasks of you know, low, low effort, high impact, I almost said high, high, impact, high effort 
low impact. But anyways, you want to take care of those uni unicorn tasks um, right away. So that way you can kind of get some familiarity under your belt and um, have a good foundation for the more fuzzier things. Um, next, cherish those easy wins. So when you do come across an easy win, savor it. Um, because I think the main work of web performance is kind of getting in the weeds and pulling things apart. Um, make it sustainable, right? So you want to make sure that web performance is part of the development lifecycle on your team and not just like kind of a one-time thing. So um, making it sustainable is really helpful and that comes in um, prioritizing level of confidence over impact when it comes down to it. And then last but not least, I had to say it, have fun. Web performance is fun. You know that's why we're all here. So um, enjoy while you're working on it. And that's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mel, for all those pieces of advice and optimization tips. Uh, now, do you have questions about this presentation? Thank you for the thank you for the presentation. As uh, Nasaldin from Steam, my question is about uh, that in the slide that you have said just uh, that lazy loading. We have it's a good practice now, but it's sometimes a bad practice. So we suggest some solution to replace this approach because uh, we don't need always to to load all the all the whole content of our page. So there is oh, a, yeah. yeah a good solution. And the, my second question is sometimes we. We we launched the, the the metrics to to have a, a perf result of our of our website like Lighthouse for example, and we we find that sometimes this it's a random results. So do you have any, any idea about, about the good conditions to test that to, to launch that to have a, a good result or a very good result to it's that it's pro to to the experience of user. Yeah. So the second question is. Um, do you have advice on how to test to make sure you're yeah. getting like results that a user would get? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, fine. totally. Okay, Thank awesome. You. So um, lazy loading, right? Definitely do it. It's a great practice. Um, what I was saying is that you want to be careful and make sure that your LCP element is not lazy loaded. So definitely, I still recommend lazy loading along with many others. Um, it's important, but I was just kind of pointing that out as saying, be careful about best practices. Don't apply them kind of with a blind eye, because if you're lazy loading your LCP element, then that can really hurt um, your metrics and the user experience. Um, and so I guess how to make sure that you're not lazy loading your LCP element is to you know do synthetic testing, um, take a look at how your pages are constructed and understand what your LCP element is and make sure that it's not part of your lazy, like, you know, if you have an in-house or a third-party lazy loading um, library, make sure that it's not included in that. Um, how to test to uh, make sure that you're getting kind of the experience that a user would get? I mean, that's the big question, right? Like, <laughs> I feel like that's why we're all here, is to, uh, like one thing that um, I work with um, Sergey on my team, and um, one thing that he always says is, you know, the best thing for web performance is implementing, like, getting inside the user's brain and um, seeing exactly what they think and exactly how they experience a site. However, that's sadly not possible, and so the best thing that we have are metrics. I guess I would make sure I would say, um, you know. When you do run a web page test, look at all of the advanced settings and make sure you're trying to replicate what your mo like what your user base um, is coming in with. So network speed, device, location, those types of things. And then also, once you do run web page test results or Lighthouse results, cross-reference that with RUM. So let's say your web page test comes back and um, it says, oh, your LCP is really bad, right? You want to then, before, like, investing a bunch of resources, you want to then look at your RUM um, data and make sure that that is actually what's happening for enough of your users to invest, basically. Une dernière question. Uh, 
Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, what I wanted to ask is, um, what do you use uh, at ETI to cross-reference your, your RAM? So what's your tool, in fact, to, to measure your performance? What are you using? Yeah, that's a um, good question. So my company actually has an in-house system um, to measure RAM. So we built kind of like um, a way to, to take in web performance data and then analyze it on our own. And it's nice because um, on the web performance team, you can, um, since you have that in-house in system, if you really want to see something, you can kind of slice and dice the data as much as you want. Um, so if you can, roll your own, but I know that it can be hard. So um, other, you know, other sites like um, Speed Curve, um, there's many third, third party sites. So yeah, I would recommend um, getting, whether or not you're rolling your own or using a third party service, getting really familiar with the data. And um, what I've done is the people that are really experienced at web performance at my company, I've said, hey, can I just literally watch you go through the data? And like, can you just think out loud and tell me what you're thinking? So that way I kind of know, oh, OK, this is why they're going into this table. Or this is why we're looking at this metric right now. So that's kind of what I would recommend. Okay. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.